I'm sorry, my audio was off. <laughs> anyway, welcome to uh, Physics 10. Today is uh, September 17th. Today we have a new topic that we're going to be exploring. And uh, basically we covered so far a lot. We did a lot. We did uh, the three laws of Newton, which I uh, stated that they are the foundation upon which everything is actually is built. The promise is if you know how to apply them, and when to apply them, you should really not need anything past those three laws. The first law I remind you was the law of inertia that says basically an object at rest will remain at rest. And if it was moving, it's going to continue moving with the same speed in the same direction if that object is under no net forces. The second law which is really called the law because it is the one that uh, we do a lot of work with that says basically if an object is under net forces that object's motion will change namely we have an acceleration the acceleration is a change in motion both in direction and magnitude now that change in motion is proportional of course to the force but it's also inversely proportional to the mass which is the inertia which is really the resistance of the object to the change of its motion. So those are the first and the second law. Well, what happens when I have more than an object in the universe, which is the case that we deal with a lot? There are two possibilities. Possibility one is that these objects are non-interacting, in which case I treat each and every one of them as a single object and basically tally the forces. If the forces are zero, I apply first law. If the, if the forces end up to being non-zero, then in this case, I apply the second law. Now, if this uh, object interact, they do so in such a way that they obey the third law, which states that if an object exerts a force on another object, the second one exerts a force that is equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. Now, this covers everything. There is nothing left to be said, basically. These three laws, there, that's it. There is no other situation in here to be explored. Then uh, we ask the question, so why in the world do we need to continue? Because there are some lingering questions that are really probably need to be addressed. One of them was, for example, the case when the mass was not constant. We cited a lot of examples in there. Uh, for example, the rocket uh, taken off, uh, sand being uh, added to a moving object, things like that, basically. Uh, during a collision, two objects come in and will become one object, or during an explosion, one object becomes many objects. So these are situations that are kind of ambiguous based on the first, second, and third laws, because all of them assume that the mass is somehow constant or can really ta fully tallied by itself. Well, from there, we derive the concept of momentum, and that keeps track of the flying pieces whichever way they go. In terms of momentum, actually, there is a version now of the second law that basically says that forces do change momentum, because momentum in this sense is really motion in terms of mass and velocity. So basically, we appended, we did not abandon completely Newton's laws, we corrected the slightly, we introduced a new concept, and we, there we went flying, basically, and covered that situation. Then we said, okay, that's good. Now we have covered all of our bases, three laws, good, modified with the concept of momentum, we can even account for the fact that mass changes. Then we asked another question, if you guys remember, was... Uh, okay, we are happy, we know where we are, we're good, we can do whatever we want to with these three laws. Now, we ask the question, and that question was, how does the force does it? What is the secret of the force? We know it changes motion, we grant that. I mean, that's, that's, that's we, we learned, somebody basically taught us this, and we know it for sure. But we want to know the secret of how the force does it. If I take an object from position one to position two over a long period of time, they are not necessarily in the same place in space. Uh, the force probably moved it there, and it did. At each and every one of those instances going from location one to location two, F equals to MA. The object was under net forces, okay? The, ob the second law of Newton applied there. But overall, what happened? Well, it turns out the answer to the question was the force works to change the kinetic energy of the object. It turns out this theorem, the work energy theorem, is as good as 
is equivalent as to Newton's laws of motion. In other words, Newton's laws of motion, when we granted them, we arrived to the work energy theorem. Now, we could do the other way around. We could say, okay, let's start with the work energy theorem, and now we can come to Newton's laws of motion. So the Newton's laws of motion, they don't become uh, uh, as fundamental, but as a consequence of the work energy theorem. So there is an equivalence between these two concepts. In other words, we're building an edifice. We're building a building now, beautiful building, a symphony, if you wish. And we laid the foundation in the beginning based on Newton's laws of motion. We said, okay, these are the foundation. We can build now our concepts in physics. Or alternatively, we can build another, the same building using a different uh, blueprint in this case, different foundation, namely the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, work energy theorem. What I'm telling you is the two buildings are the same. They are the same building. They are not different. The blueprints, they look, you're looking at it just from the other angle, that's all. It looks a little bit different, that's all. So the work energy theorem from which we got into concepts such as kinetic energy, potential energy, we got into the concept of work, we got into the concept of even power, which is related to the work and the rate at which work is done. So all of that is basically a concept that derived from that simple question that we asked, okay? So what, can, what else can we do? Now we're building the building. Now we're, we're, we did the foundation. Now we want to, to come up, okay? We want to, to really build this, this, this knowledge that we want to build, namely physics as we know it. So if anything from this class that you learn, first of all, are the three laws of Newton. That is actually a big deal, okay? If uh, those are not, then alternatively, the work energy theorem, force works, a uh, force works, to change the kinetic energy of an object, okay? It's a kind of a mouthful, and it's really probably not as common as the other one, but it's really as powerful as the other one. Both of them have the same, basically, potency. Now, uh, so what's the deal today? We're doing today rotation. Here is the problem, okay? We want to basically build on what we know. What we have said, from the beginning until today, until this moment, actually. We were talking about a specific kind of object, and that object is really a point particle. We neglected its size. We don't care about its size. So a mass, as far as we're concerned, even a car, the way we described it, it's actually treated as just a point in space. So we didn't take size, physical size, into account. We took just its property, which is mass, and we started thinking in terms of, uh, which we call it, uh, forces and accelerations and things like that. Even when we came to the point where we wanted to tally the forces and we did the so-called three-body diagram, we replaced the entire geometry just by a point in space, okay? So today, we want to grow from, basically, we want to, 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 to graduate from the point to an actual object, a physical object, okay? So this is a big step. So this is why we have to take into account something else. That's really why we need to move on to different properties. A point, for example, doesn't have physical properties. In other words, a point, for example, uh, if you rotate a point around its axis, it doesn't rotate because it's a point. It has no axis. But an object now can spin, can rotate. A finite size object can rotate, okay? So that's really why we have to, we have to consider uh, 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 objects that have finite size. And even that is hard for us. And even that, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to make it simpler than that. We're going to simplify the object for ourselves a little, okay? Because real objects like this one, for example, is if you squeeze it hard enough, it actually compresses. No matter how rigid the object is, no matter how strong it is, if you compress it or you pull, it, pull on it, it's going to give in one way or the other. Okay, the object we're going to consider now is an ideal object, and that object is a so-called rigid object. A rigid object, in a sense, two points on the object will retain their distance no matter which way this object goes. It can go up, the entire object, or down. These two points stay the same distance. So if they were separated, let's say, for example, by seven centimeters, that distance stays seven centimeters whether they were up or down. If I move it sideways, this way or the other way, same thing. The seven centimeters between 
these two points remain the same. And as a matter of fact, any po distance between two points is going to be the same. Now, if I move it into the screen and out of the screen, same thing happens. So this object, whichever way you move it, up and down, left and right, in and out, it keeps its distance of different points the same. Now, if I spin it around a point, remember, a, a point particle cannot spin because it doesn't have an axis. This one does because it's a finite size. It's not negligible size. So if you spin it around an axis, I am assuming that the distance between the two points, no matter which two points you take, retains, remains the same. Spin, spin it around this axis or around this axis or around basically the axis that goes around it. So now we have a new kind of motion that we didn't encounter before. And that is a rotation around an axis passing through the rigid body, okay? So what we're gonna do in here, instead of even studying this rigid body, which is an ideal situation, okay? I said that already a rigid body doesn't exist in reality. Everybody has some rigidity, yes, but it's going to give in under a lot of pressure. It's going to crack, basically, and the distances between its points start to change, either decrease or increase. If you pull on it, it's going to increase. If you compress on it, it's going to decrease. Like, for example, water, it's not rigid. I mean, you can basically stretch the water, basically, and make it longer or bring it together in smaller volume. So that's not rigid, buddy, okay? Uh, uh, my finger, for example, is not rigid. For example, the distance between this point and this point is not the same. Now it's all of a sudden it's shrunk between this point and that point. So that's not rigid, buddy. So that's not what I'm studying in here. So in other words, there are a lot of objects that we're neglecting already from the get-go, even in this definition of a rigid body. This could be approximated to a rigid body. I'm going to think that maybe this is a good enough rigid body for my experiment. A rock, for example, is a rigid body, okay? So that's basically what I mean by rigid body in here. So that is the simplification, number one. Simplification number two also to make the problem easy for us and focus only on one aspect of it because I know how it's going to move up and down, left and right, in and out, and that is actually because then I'm going to focus only at one point on it, and that probably the center of mass or any point in it, it doesn't matter. But the center of mass, which we're going to introduce in this chapter, can be a good point to describe the motion of this object in and out, left and right, up and down. So I'm not going to focus on that. So what I'm going to do to this, rather, I'm going to nail one point in it. It doesn't matter which point that is. It could be at the end. It could be in the middle. It could be to the left any point that is fixed in it, okay? So basically take a hammer and nails, nail the thing to the wall. Then that rigid body is, cannot now move in and out or left and right, and that's not possible anymore because if it does move in and out, remember it's nailed from one end and that nailing is fixed so well that it's not going to move. If it moves one way or the other, that means it's going to stretch or compress, and we're saying that it's rigid, it won't do that. So the only thing that it can do then is rotate around that fixed point, okay? Yes, uh, you're right. I mean, I'm saying points because I'm assuming that my rigid body is actually a two-dimensional body, which is flat, but you're right, it fixed the entire axis, okay? So the entire axis is fixed so that it can move around the entire axis, okay? So if I fix it this way, if I fix it, for example, what is it, this way, or it doesn't matter. So there are three possibilities for its motion. Or it can fix this axis actually and have it throw a spin around, okay? So those, that is the key concept that we're coming into today. So there is something to learn from physics regardless about all of the concept that we deal with. And that is, it takes real world problem, problems in real life, okay? And it wants to solve them. Obviously, you can't solve a problem. Any problem, anybody tells you, okay, here's a problem, for example, I have, uh, I have to solve this issue. You cannot tackle the problem from the get-go. You cannot do that. You have to make the problem, first of all, eliminate all the, come up only with the main issue first, solve that, and then start to embellish your solution with more and more additions that are not as important as the first ones, okay? So you make, you solve the main problem first, and then you take the secondary problem and then the tertiary problem and then whatever comes after. So basically that's what we're saying. In other words, we said, okay, point, point particle because it was a lot easier for us to ignore the sizes. Now we're assuming the sizes are, are important. So instead of tackling all objects like water and uh, gas and all kinds of things that we can, and we're gonna get into liquids at some point, uh, 
then we're going to focus just on solid, solid objects. And even solids, we're not going to study them, all of them. We're going to study only a class of solids that don't stretch and compress. If you're concerned about the compression and the uh, stretching of objects, it's coming. It's called elasticity. That's another topic also <laughs> that we're going to get into. But first, let's solve the big issue first. And then once we get into it, then we're going to talk about elasticity, fluids, and gases, and all of the other things that are associated with our phenomena. Do you understand how the approach is in physics? It really was a pioneering uh, uh, field of science that led to other things that are applied everywhere else, this method of solving problems. I mean, if you ask right now a computer engineer and tell him, okay, I want you to solve, for example, a problem. I have a warehouse, for example, with my, uh, uh, and I sell this much things. Can you please bring a program for me or uh, write a code for me so that I can track for my inventory, do also keep track of, uh, for example, uh, my employees, keep track of, for example, uh, of the accounting system, keep track, for example, of the security cameras I have in here, keep track of the time, keep track of the trucks that are in and out. Uh, you can't solve the entire problem in computer science that way. You have to basically tackle one issue at a time. For example, module one, let's focus, for example, on the inventory issue. Second model is the employees, which has different requirements and different data to keep track of, and so on and so forth. So that idea of solving problems by basically breaking it into smaller and smaller components and adding them at the end toward the solution of the entire thing is actually borrowed from physics because that's how physics really started this whole thing. And it's a clever approach to solving problems. So this is regardless of what you take from this class in terms of concepts, the method of solving problems also is really critical. So this is what I'm trying to say in this case in here. So we moved from a point charge, from point particle, I'm sorry. Now we're getting into uh, objects that are not point, they have real sizes and we're starting with a rigid body. Does this make sense to you guys? Did you buy my argument? Okay, at least one person did. Okay, very good, more than one. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Okay, so let's get into the, uh, the subject in here, okay? So today's topic is what? Uh, no, it's not chapter nine. Okay. So again, it's rotational motion. This is the topic of the day today. And uh, for that, we're gonna talk about circular motion because clearly we have a motion around the point in here, which is like a circle, okay? So we're gonna talk about that. And then we're going to introduce a concept similar to the mass because we had in before the mass, which was a defining characteristic in terms of uh, resistance to the change in motion, to the change in the linear motion, okay? From now on, you're going to hear the word angular, 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 because that's really how things are added. In compa compared with what we've been ta dealing with so far, which was really linear, 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 but we were not saying it because we assumed that the motion is in a line or some sort of a direction. This one actually is a wrong angle, okay? So in addition to the mass, which we discovered, oops, I'm not, a long time ago, we have uh, the, 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 uh, the moment of uh, rotational inertia. This is the linear inertia, the mass, okay? The mass was the resistance to change in motion in the case of linear motion. The rotational inertia is really, or the moment of inertia is really the resistance of the change in motion, in rotational motion, that is. So this is equivalent to linear mass, okay? The torque now, in the old days, we used to talk about force changing motion, force changing motion. What we really should have been saying is force changes linear motion, okay? Torque, on the other hand, changes rotational motion. You see, circular motion. You see, now we're getting with parallels. So this is equivalent to the force, if you like, okay? And then the center of mass versus the center of gravity, which is a key concept when we're dealing with, the, with, the, with objects in motion because we, keep, we need to track them actually in space too, and the center of mass is a convenient way of doing it. We talk about the centripetal force, which is the force that causes the object to stay on a circle, okay? Centrifugal force is kind of uh, questionable in terms of concepts. It's really an inertial uh, force, okay? Inertial force. All forces in nature 
are due to interaction between two objects, okay? And there are only four forces in nature, really. There is a force of a gravity, which have discovered so far, and there is the electrostatic force that we dealt with it when we were talking about friction and the normal forces and all of that, actually uh, electrostatic forces. And there are two nuclear forces. The centrifugal force is not really a force, it's an inertial force, okay? which don't require interaction. As a matter of fact, in the reaction, they are the resistance of the object to changing its motion. Same thing with the MA, when we were de dealing with F equals to MA, this is a kind of also uh, uh, MA, okay? This is another MA, if you wish, okay? It's a motion. It's basically, you have a string attached to a mass and it's spinning as long as you can keep it on going. And then if you cut or let go of it, it's going to fly forward. And that is the so-called centrifugal force, okay? But it's really F equals to uh, uh, MA or the first law of Newton that keeps it going in that direction. Same thing, for example, if you're not, uh, 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 if you don't have your seat belt and you're going around a curve, and what you feel in this case is that you're ejected in, in the opposite direction with which way the car is moving. And that is a so-called centrifugal force, okay? So it's not a real force in a sense that is resulting from the interaction of two objects. It's a reaction due to inertia, that's all, okay? So that's why I wanted to clarify this from the get-go because there are a lot of physicists who hate to classify it as a force because it's, a, it's really a, a, a reaction to the change in motion, that's all, okay? A centripetal force now can be a real force and that is the force that you're holding the string with it. If you don't hold the string, where the mass is attached and you're pulling on it and you're spinning it, uh, the force, the, the mass will not go around in a circular motion. So that could, and that is really simple to explain. Well, it's your hand holding the string in this case, though it's resulting from a, an, an interaction and that interaction is between your hand and the string. Again, forces are known to be interaction between two objects, okay? Like a push and a pull, okay? And then we're going to talk about rotating reference frames and uh, we simulate gravity. This is what you see in movies, for example, sci-fi sci movies. People are uh, in space, supposedly in empty space, away from any supermassive object like planets, like Earth or moons or anything like that. And they're walking in their, uh, their, their uh, capsules, wherever they are, and they're talking, sipping their coffee, and basically chatting, supposedly having uh, artificial air basically being pumped there for, to, for them to breathe, and so on and so forth. So how in the world are they going to walk like that? And don't, the minute you basically try to move, you jump and hit the ceiling or something like that. Well, you can simulate gravities in these situations by using the so-called uh, basically centripetal uh, acceleration, which is in this case V squared over the radius, okay? If, or, or the angular frequency times squared times uh, the radius. If the entire thing is spinning fast enough for you, you can have this quantity to be exactly G, 9.8 meter per second. And as far as you're concerned, your own weight is in there. So you really don't feel any kind of uh, problem so you can move around. Not only that, there is actually uh, uh, problems with the biology of the human, especially in terms of bone losses and things like that. If we stay in extended periods of time in zero gravity, our bones start to basically lose functionality and our bodies start to change. So for uh, astro astronauts, really it's a good idea to have some sort of uh, gravity there, otherwise they will become, it will become a problem for them. So actually, it's not just an option for them to sip coffee, but it's actually a necessity if you want to be there in space for a long, long time, especially if you're going to be considering uh, uh, interplanetary uh, travel or possibly more than that. So you really have to have some sort of gravity. Otherwise, the biology of the person changes enough so that the person would look like those people on uh, the movie. Uh, I don't know how to spell. Is it Wally like this? Did I spell it right? Or with only single L? Do you know what I'm talking about or not? <laughs> okay, that movie where the people look all kinds of a, basically some sort of, <laughs> they cannot move sitting in their chairs. Chairs seem to confirm what I said, okay? I don't know if the others probably are not uh, familiar with this movie. It's a long, it's, it's been a long time since they had it on. Okay. So uh, basically, you need to, you need simulated gra uh, gravity for those purposes too. Okay, 
Then we're going to introduce the concept of angular momentum, just as much as we had uh, uh, momentum, which we really we should be calling it from now on linear momentum as opposed to angular momentum, uh, because uh, now we have a motion that is in a circular motion. Uh, then we're going to discover a concept related to angular momentum, which is the uh, conservation of angular momentum. If you look at the planets in the solar system, starting from Mars all the way to Neptune, and even add to them uh, the uh, Ceres, which is a dwarf planet between Mars and Jupiter, or add to them uh, the dwarf planet Pluto, or whatever planet you think of they are all more or less on the same plane, okay, moving around the sun. That's number one. Number two, they are all spinning in the same direction, okay? It's not like one of them. I mean, there is a little bit of complication with a couple of planets, namely Venus and, uh, was it Uranus? Yeah, one of them is flipped on its side and the other one is actually flipped backward, okay? So with the exception of these two objects, all of the other objects, they are moving in the same direction with a little bit of tilt, like the Earth is tilted 23 degrees, so it's not really sitting on its axis exactly. That's probably due to some later collisions. All of that can be explained just with the conservation of angular momentum. The entire solar system, and as a matter of fact, the entire galaxy, if you look at it, it's flattened a little bit. It has a bulge inside, but in the entire galaxy has that thing. It's all due to our friend angular momentum. Isn't it amazing? So far, just by introducing a few concepts, we are able to talk about the shape of the galaxy and the solar system. What do you guys think? Isn't this... I mean, we've been together for about now four weeks or so. You can explain the shape at least of the solar system and that of the galaxy based on this concept that we have learned in physics so far, namely the angular momentum, okay? I mean, I cannot really, I mean, I, I like these things, that's why I'm doing them, so otherwise I probably would be writing code somewhere, which I don't like to do, okay? So, So when an object turns about an internal axis, it is undergoing a circular motion, okay? So I'm gonna take this object. It's a kind of weird, basically flat object, okay? Uh, think about it as a Frisbee. A frisbee that doesn't have depth, okay? It's a bad Frisbee, okay? So think of it as a potato chip, okay? And then what I'm going to do is, just to answer the question of the I don't remember who raised the issue of the axis earlier. It was Kyle, actually. Uh, so that we can, I, can, I, can, I can be granted the point of talking about specific points in this rigid body. Okay? Now I can say this point and it is fixed because it's a two-dimensional object. It's like a, uh, like a tortilla. Okay? Again, it's a poorly made tortilla. I mean, I think tortillas are much more uh, <laughs> round than this one. Anyway, the point with it is one and it, and tortilla is not a rigid body, by the way. Okay, we need it to have it solid. It should not really come together like this. And so that's a bad example, tortilla. Probably potato chip is a little bit better than this one. Okay, than the tortilla. So or or a frisbee. Okay. So if I fix that point in it, and if we agree that the direction east west is the direction with which we measure angles, pointing e east is where the positive direction. So this is basically any angle is measured with respect to that one. So if you tell me, for example, any point in the rigid body, now this point, for example, let's say if it's making, for example, an angle of looks like 40 degrees, okay? And we know every single point in the rigid body which angle it's making. We know it, we can measure it, we can see it, we can use protractor and find the angles and so on and so forth. Remember, this point is fixed, it's not moving. So that means the entire rigid body cannot translate one way or the other or up or down. That's the only two possibilities because it's flat. It cannot come in and out of the screen because we're assuming that it lives on the screen, okay? So in this case, one of us, for example, leaves. 
doesn't matter. Let's say, for example, Jeffrey leaves. He knows this picture. Okay? He has seen it. He knows exactly what, the, what this thing looks like. And we want to keep Jeffrey updated about the, posi uh, the, sh the position of this object. Since this object cannot move, the only thing we can give Jeffrey is the angle with which it has spun. So you can remember that point that we agreed on when we measured its location at 40 degrees? Did I put a hand? No, this is 40. Okay, that's the, that's the angle direction. Okay. Now, after one hour, actually, it's no longer 40 degrees. Now it's actually, let's say, for example, it's 80 degrees. Okay. So now Jeffrey can make, in, can make up in his mind how the shape of the entire thing has spun. Do you guys see that? Because every single point has to move with the same angle. So now the angle is the measurement of displacement. But it's an angle of displacement, not a, uh, not, a, not, a, uh, not a linear displacement. Not in meters anymore. It's going to be in degrees or radians if you like to use radians. Okay? And scientists use radians. You guys understand where the need for this whole thing is? Yes? So now we can keep him posted just basically by giving him an update. Every single hour, here is what the angle is. Okay? That's it. Just like, for example, if we had an object on an axis and we told him that the object was at 40 centimeters and he left and we want to keep him updated. So again, after one hour, that object has moved to 80 centimeters and so on and so forth. But now we're doing it with an angle. So, but we have to agree actually on the origin of the measuring of the angle, just as much as we have to agree also on the axis where the origin is. So that's not a change, did not change at all. The fact that we chose the X, uh, the X axis basically pointing toward the east being the positive direction is just our choice. The same thing, we take any point on the axis and say that's the origin, that is our choice. So that does not diminish or add to the problem anything. The only change in here is that the rigid body now can rotate. So now we can talk actually about two kinds of, mo uh, 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 of velocities. One of them, the actual velocity with which the object is actually moving around, because it's actually moving, okay? Albeit moving in a circle, okay? And the angle of velocity with which it's sweeping the angles with which it's moving. Because if every hour it gains 40, 40 degrees, then Jeffrey can, we don't have to update them after that. He knows after three hours, he can punch in the numbers and he can find that it's 120, what is it? 120 degrees and so on and so forth, okay? If it does 40 degrees per hour. After three hours, three times 40 should be 120 degrees. Same thing. If we give him the speed, the same thing. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. That's really what I want to get into in here between the two phenomena. Okay. Now the trouble with that is because of this picture in here, you can clearly see an object that is closer to the center of rotation. I'm taking we're taking in this case the center of mass of being the center of rotation. Any point can be a center of rotation. For for this simpler case, it's actually the center of mass too, the center of the geometry the center center per se, then in this case, an object closer to the center of rotation always will move less distance for the same object that is further away. Because the rigid body has to retain its rigidity. That is the reason why. I mean, if this point and this point were separated by four centimeters, they need to retain their four centimeters between them. Otherwise, the rigid body is no longer rigid. So if this moved, for example, more or less, Let's say, for example, this moved in here. Yes, then probably this distance is different than or the same that this, that distance if you like, want it. But that's not going to be a rigid body anymore because clearly this distance is shorter than this distance. So in this case, in order to retain the rigidity, objects that are closer by will move less than objects that are further, uh, further away. So that is the condition of rigidity, actually. Okay. An object that is twice as far from the center of rotation will need to move twice as fast on the tangent than the object on the center, okay? And this is actually a key concept, too, that is related to uh, the angular momentum later on when we'll talk about it, okay? This is the relation between the tangential speed, because there are two speeds, actually, that we can talk about, okay? In the so-called uniform motion, there is only one, which is a tangential speed. In a non-uniform motion, you may have a radial speed too. Because an object can decide, 
okay? If it can move in, then it can have a radial, uh, a radial component. In this case, it can't. It's always along the tangent and toward the tangential. Omega, which is this symbol, is the number of rotation per... It's actually not a number of rotations. I'm sorry. It's the radians per second. It's really a measure of the distance. So if velocity is in meter per second, Re, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the radius is in meters, then the only unit that is acceptable for omega, it's uh, uh, radians per second. And radians actually is not a unit. Okay? Radius is just a measure of the angles in terms of uh, pi and so on and so forth. Okay? So that's the unit for it. More often, though, you hear the word RPM. Like the one on your car, okay? RPM stands for rotation per minute. And to convert from an RPM to an actual omega, you have to... Uh, revolution is actually 2 pi, and per minute is actually 60 seconds. So it's 2 pi over 60. So if you're curious how many... Uh, uh, what is the angular velocity of, your, uh, of the engine of your car, and if, let's say, for example, it's, 12, it's 2,000 RPM, you multiply 2,000 by 2 pi, which is 6, divided by 60. So, I mean, 2 pi is 6 point something, okay, 6.28. Uh, so, it's 6 times 2,000, that's about 12,000, divided by 60. So, you do the math, it's about 200 uh, radians per second, okay? But people on, in the industry, they use RPM, okay, when they're doing uh, revolutions. Here is the word RPM. But for this specific question, it's irrelevant, it says that a ladybug sits halfway between the rotational axis and the outer edge. So this is the, it's midway in here, and the, uh, the edge is in there, okay? When the turntable has a rotational speed of 20 RPM, and the bug has a tangential speed of 20 centimeters, or 2 centimeters per second. So it's moving, it's, it's holding on its thing, okay? So the whole thing is moving. So... It's moving with two centimeter per second. What we're talking about in here, we're talking about the, the, the turntable, okay? Because it's holding itself on it. Now, what will be the tangential, ten, uh, ten, rotational and tangential speeds of, the, of her friend who sits at the outer edge? Her friend will have the same rotational speed, so that's not gonna change. So the 20 RPM will be the same. As a matter of fact, it's not given you as an option at all in this answers in here, because her rotational speed will stay the same. What changes though is the tangential speed. The tangential speed, since it's sitting twice as far, it should be twice as much, okay? Four centimeter per second. Because remember, the relationship is V equals to R omega. You double R, since this one is sitting at the center and it's two centimeter per second, its friend who's sitting uh, twice as far, which is at the edge, should have twice as much velocity because omega is the same the angular velocity is the same, or the angular uh, the rotation in this case, the rotational speed is the same. Does this make sense to you guys? Yes, maybe? Okay, okay it's one person, two, good. So it makes sense. Okay, I already mentioned the fact that the... Uh, the mass is what was the inertia in linear motion. Now we have a new kind of inertia, which the symbol for it is I, okay? Remember when we introduced the, uh, the impulse also, we gave it the symbol I, actually it's symbol J, I'm sorry, we gave, we gave it the symbol J, so we're safe. This one actually is the moment of inertia or the inertial rotational inertia. The only difference really between mass and moment of inertia is that the moment of inertia depends not just on the amount of matter that you have in the object, but it depends on how the matter is distributed too. Okay? So that's the example with it. So in this example in here, I have two, what are they, dumbbells in here, and the same rod that is carried in here. But the two masses are closer, or the two masses are further. Okay? One of them has higher inertia than the other, okay? Like for example, this is an object that I made out of a, 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 a rod, 
and this heavy, basically cutting uh, uh, blade. I, I, I wrapped around it a uh, tape to hold it in place, actually. And I want to do an experiment in here with you guys, and I want everyone to vote. You have two options. Option one, away from the mass. Let me stop the chair, this thing in here. So option one, and you're going to vote. Okay, hold on. Don't vote yet. Away from the heavy. And then I'm going to say option two, near the heavy. So let me explain what I'm trying to say in here, okay? So those are your two options. So all of you will vote now after I explain what the prompt is first, after I explain what the problem is, what the experiment we're going to do is. And you tell me, is it easier to balance it, this object in their option one or in their option two? I'm going to put my finger not on the... Uh, where is my thing in here? Can I block everything? No, I can't, I guess. Not on the knife itself, but on the object in here. Do you guys understand? I'm still putting it on the rod. I'm not putting it on the, on the knife itself. So those are your two options. Which one is easier to use my hand to balance this after I let go from the top or from the bottom, not touching the blade or anything like that, just touching the rod by itself? Which one do you think is? Option one, away from the, the mass, the heavy mass, or option two, closer to the heavy mass. Okay, one voter, I need everybody. Option one, near the heavy. Okay, again, uh, everybody just, this is not democracy, by the way, everybody has to vote, okay? It's not like democracy when they give you options. Choose not to vote, okay? Let me make sure that I have as many people. Uh, so I have a lot of people, okay? I have several people who voted. Some said one. Kaya thinks one. Jeffrey thinks one, which is away from the mass. One thinks it's two, actually, near the mass. Patricia, so two. V thinks two. Michelle thinks two. Isaac. If we were in class, I will have you, actually. Taryn, what did you say? That's not good. You need to vote, Taryn. Okay, you said two now, okay. Two is here, okay? Oh, you did before, okay. Two is here, and one is here. Okay, if we were inside the classroom, actually I make something a little bit uh, different. I would really ask one representing group one who thinks one is the option, and one representing group two who thinks the option, and then have you balance it. So I'm gonna try it with option two first, okay? And option two, the mass is closer from the center of rotation. It's actually kind of, it's not <laughs> possible, okay? It's very hard, okay? The ones who said option two, option one, I'm sorry, is the one where uh, actually the mass is away from it. So I'm gonna try to do it. Okay, if one of you does it, probably it lasts longer. Option one is the correct answer, okay? So for those who got it correct, bravo, okay? For those who did not get it correct, it's because probably you were thinking it's much easier <laughs> to do it. Yes, thank you, Kyle, okay? So <laughs> actually I had it completely wrapped up, okay? So <laughs> okay, that's the only heavy mass I could find that sticks next to all of the other masses there. I have magnets, but I didn't want to say the magnet there interfering with it or anything like that, okay? But the point being in here, actually, if I were in the lab, we have heavy masses. I put 500 grams, basically half a kilogram around one end of a long rod and we do that in the, in the lab a lot safer. Anyway, the point being in here actually is one of them has a higher inertia than the other. Both of them have the same mass. If I were this object, it has the same mass. Because, but if I put the mass away, it has higher inertia because this heavy part is very far away from the center of rotation. Therefore, it's high inertia will allow it to stay longer. It's very difficult to change its state of motion. So if it was stationary, 
it takes a lot of torque to spin it. Whereas in this case, the mass is very close, the heavy mass is very close from the center of rotation, it has less rotational inertia. So in this case, it's very easy to move. So the minute, it doesn't like take a lot of torque for it to move. That's why. You guys understand the reason why? If you have a, if you have a baseball bat, I'm glad that everybody is cut, catching up. If you have a baseball bat, you can clearly see which end is easier to balance on. Not on the big bulky side, but it's actually on the, on the light side. Did, uh, somebody, I think, in this class did baseball, no? Or probably in the other class, I don't remember. One of you guys was in softball team or something like that. Anyway, you could try that with a baseball bat and you will see, okay? It's much easier on the, on the pointy end to balance it than on the other side, okay? So that was fun. Hopefully you guys can try it at home. And like Kyle said, or I don't remember, I think Kyle is the one who said, warned us not to harm ourselves in the process. So don't use a cutting paper cutting thing like I did in here, okay? The reason why it's difficult to rotate this, this one, the second one, is because the masses are very far away. So it has a higher inertia than where the masses are close from the center of rotation. I'm assuming this person is going to spin it one way or the other, like this. So it's much higher, uh, much more difficult to do the second option than the first option. Okay? Yes? This is the same thing with a guy trying to balance him or herself, himself, actually, on this thing in here, okay? So when you see people, that's because now he has actually a big eye, okay? That is the moment of inertia, okay? Try it without this thing, and you will see it's going to be super hard because he will have a lot less inertia. Again, the moment of inertia depends on the axis of rotation, okay? In this case, for example, if I take a pen, it really depends on which way I'm going to rotate it, on this axis, on this axis, or what is it? On this axis. Not only, it depends on the location of the axis too. Sometimes it's much easier to locate it around the center of mass versus away from the center of mass and so on and so forth. Here is examples. All of these objects have the same masses. The highest moment of inertia is for a point particle. This one can be treated as a point particle. This is a ring, okay? The same thing with the, what is this? A hoop about that, oh no, this is about the center of rotation like this. Now this is the center of rotation. You take it basically a ring, you have two options, either spin it around this axis or spin it around this axis, okay? Spin it like this. So that's basically what that means. And the numerical values, or at least the formulas are given there. Again, you take a, a, a rod, and you move it around one end, like this one, or you move it around its center of mass. So each one has a different value. And this is for a sphere, a solid sphere, and this is for a cylinder, okay? Cylinder and a disc are the same. A disc is an object that is like a ring, except that it's full, okay? Here is your question of the day. I don't know the answer. You're going to tell me the disc, okay? I don't want to know why. So a hoop and a disc, a hoop is like a ring, okay? Uh, are released from the top of an inclined at the same speed. Which one will reach the bottom first? We're assuming both of them have the same mass, okay? Remember, mass matters too. Both of them have the same mass. Which one will, ring, will reach the ground first? Correct answer is disc, of course. Okay, why? That is the question of the day, why? Does anybody know? Not the air resistance, not the resistance from the air. Both of that is negligible. Think about the exercise we just did. Which one has more inertia? Which one resists? The mass is the same. Jeffrey. So you have a ring like this one. Oops. Where am I? Okay. 
and think of it, this object, the same object, but it's full all the way, okay? It's gonna be a disk. Both of them have the same mass, okay? I'm assuming both of them have the same mass. You let them go from on top of an incline in the same time, and the mass is the same, one of them will gain a lot of velocity and move forward, and that is the disk, the filled one, and the one that has a hollow region in it will drag behind it. Did you guys find it? Okay, let me tell you what the answer is. The answer has to do with the previous slides. This one, okay. The moment of inertia of a ring, it's twice as much as that of a disc. So the ring has twice as much inertia as this one. In other words, this will resist the change in motion twice as much as this one. They both have the same mass. So they both have the same linear, linear, uh, linear, uh, what you call it, uh, inertia. If you, if you flatten them and let go of them on their surface without spinning, both of them will reach the ground at the same time because both of them have the same inertia. But now, if you put them on the rolling side so that they can roll and spin around their axes, then in this case, the disc will reach first because it has half, half the inertia of a ring. That's why. So that's the answer. The disc will reach there although they have the same mass, but it has less inertia. Got it, everybody? So that's your answer. Very good. So the answer is because it has less inertia, in other words, less, linear, less rotational inertia to be more specific, or angular inertia, it has less momentum of inertia than the other one by a factor of half, actually, from the previous slide. Okay, if you want to be more mathematical about it, it's about a factor of, uh, of, provided they have the same radii, because R squared in both, provided they have the same mass, then the disk will have half the inertia, the rotational inertia of a ring. Therefore, the ring will lag behind because it's resisting the change of its rotational motion twice as much as the disk is. Yes, a rotational motion, a rotational inertia in this case is the factor, the biggest factor because of the fact that they have to spin, okay? They have to rotate in order to reach the ground. So the first one is very easy because it's very easy to change its rotational motion. It has half as much as the other one. So if the first one, for example, has 100 kilograms meter squared, the second one probably has only 50 kilograms. Think about it. You have a, a, something light that you want to push and something heavy you want to push with the same force, okay? So the light object will move faster and therefore will gain far more speed and will reach the ground first, okay? Does this make sense to you guys? Okay, very good. So the answer to the prompt is, the first one at least is, the disk duh reach first because of the fact that it has less inertia than the ring. Do you want me to type this thing in here? It's not enough, Kyle. Yeah, the question is not about B or A. The question is why the disk reaches first because it has less rotational inertia, rotational inertia than the ring, if you want to be more specific, with the same mass and radius, okay? That is why. Correct, everybody? That's question one, Taryn, yes. Okay, and here it's giving you a hoop has large rotational inertia, so that's really why it's explaining it in that way. But if you go back to a slight step just up, because as I said, a cylinder and a ring are the same thing. It's the same formula, actually. In the case of the cylinder, there is no 
no no interference whatsoever no the how long the the cylinder is doesn't matter so a ring and i mean a disc and a cylinder are the same so the concept of torque is what is needed i know we are probably running a little bit behind so we need to catch up with this thing otherwise we're going to be so the tendency of a force to cause rotation is called uh, torque so the torque to be specific is a force times its lever arm okay if somebody wants to open a door okay and let's say for example that person is probably born in a place where they have never seen doors before or probably in a planet that they the person just invented the door and he said okay apply force on it 50 newton is it going to open it matters where you apply the force you can apply it right on the axis of the door and the door will not open move away from the axis and you can pull this way the handle or pull it the other way and the door still doesn't open so you have to apply it in this right direction for you to open and you probably don't need that much force to do okay so again the tor the lever arm depends on how far you are from the center of rotation because if you try to rotate it right here with any force it won't budge remember this is a rigid body it will not move so you have to move away from it so you need the distance and you need the lever arm which is the distance from the direction of the force and the center of rotation that means this angle has to be a 90 degree angle in this case it's actually the whole entire distance okay and the longer the the lever arm the less force you would need to achieve the same uh, torque and that's what probably people do when they try to for example uh, go to those heavy super heavy for example uh, heavy duty uh, which we call them nuts and you try to move them with a small wrench you will probably want so you need probably very long uh, uh, lever sometimes they have extenders to move them and you don't need as much force okay because in that case the torque will be I'm going to use the symbol T for torque, okay? That's not the correct symbol for it. It's tau, actually, the, the Greek letter tau. Torque is equal to arm length, okay? Which I'm going to use just A, times the force. So let's say, for example, you need, for example, a thousand Newton meter to achieve your, uh, your, your goal. And you can only have 10 Newtons. You don't want to spend a lot of effort. You're lazy, okay? You don't want to do that. You don't want to do more job than you what you need to 10 newtons but you need then in this case a hundred meters long okay football for a size uh, uh range now say for example you can't do that you, you only have the longest is 10 meters which is a lot still about what uh, three feet or something no what am i saying three feet three uh what is it uh, about 30 feet or something like that then in this case 10 meters then you need to pull something okay i'm gonna do it okay let me give a hundred newtons okay so 100 times 10 it's still thousand newton per meter but if it's only in one meter that's a problem because then you really need a thousand new, uh, uh, newtons thousand newtons is a lot it's about 100 kilograms 200 pounds okay so it's a lot of work now you're sweating okay so that's basically how this thing works so that's what the torque is so the torque is really what causes the change in uh, in uh, rotational motion okay so angular uh, acceleration if you wish uh, the center of mass is a key concept because all motions are around the center of mass the center of gravity so it's a weighted average of all the positions with respect to the mass or when we use a gravity in this case we call it the center of gravity okay on earth they are the same point center of mass is actually more mathematical and applies everywhere the key thing to know in here is that the center of mass is not a real object and that's probably something that is sometimes confusing actually it's a purely mathematical object this is remember when we said in the beginning any concept that we have to introduce we should be able to measure and uh, it's a physical concept this is one of them that you can't measure in the lab you can you cannot really measure i mean you can find it but it is not a physical concept it's a purely mathematical object here is the case for example if i take a rod if I have its length, it doesn't matter how long it is, one meter, for example, it has a specific mass. And if I take another one, the same length and the same mass, the center of mass, this entire system acts as if, let's say, for example, this is one kilogram and this is one kilogram. So I have a total of two kilograms. I could get rid of this entire thing and just replace it by the center of mass. 
where in the center of mass I have two kilogram. I really don't have two kilograms point particle sitting in the center of mass, but that's how it behaves. There is nothing in here. So if I bring a microscope and try to look there for two kilogram, I will not find one gram, let alone, let alone two. So that's something that we have to keep in mind. So this is a practical way. Now, in order to achieve equilibrium, the, uh, the center of mass has to go through the base surface. And that's exactly why the Pisa tower did not fall, because the center of mass, the mg in this case, passes through its base, okay? The minute this point goes on this side, this thing will tilt, okay? This thing will fall. And that's why there is that game with the, uh, with the, with the cubes, where you start piling them up, and each time when you pile them, you have to make sure that the center of mass still within the original cube, within the base uh, cube, okay, for them to stay in. So you guys know what I'm talking about? You put this one and you put another one halfway and you put another one two thirds of the way and so on and so forth. The point being in here is that the center of mass of the entire geometry has to stay inside the base one. It has to remain in there, the bottom one. Otherwise, you saw this whole thing collapses, okay? The centripetal force, I already talked about it, like this tension, for example, that the girl is holding it, okay? Uh, this is the formula for it. The centripetal force is equal to the mass times the centripetal acceleration, which is the speed squared divided by the radius. Mass is like the mass of everywhere else, okay? That's we say ma. But the a in this case is v squared over r, where r is the radius of the curvature, and V squared is the velocity with which you're moving. Case in point, for example, when you go on a curve, even when you have cruise control on the car, you feel like your body is moving in the opposite direction than the rotation. So if the car is moving this way, your body feels like it's going that way. The only reason why it's doing that is because of the inertia. It wants to move in the opposite direction where it's being accelerated. It's accelerated toward the center of the curvature. Your body wants to move away from the acceleration because of uh, the, uh, its inertia property. So in this case, there is actually an acceleration there, albeit there is no change in the actual speed. The car is on cruise control, but there is a change in the direction of motion. Therefore, there is an acceleration. And the value of the acceleration on a curve depends on two things, on the speed and on uh, the, uh, uh, the radius. That's why in engineers who build roads, they are always careful on curves to tilt the road a little bit called banking. You bank the road a little bit. You give it a tilt. And, uh, or you give it a lot of friction also. So there are a lot of engineering going there to, to determine the minimum speed with which a car does not slide. Because if the car comes in too fast, its inertia will push it out of the road and basically uh, get out of the way. So usually, when you come on a curve, there is a speed limit that tells you, okay, this curve, you can do it at 45 miles per hour, 35 miles per hour, some bad curves in here between uh, Redlands actually and uh, on, uh, what is it, Tipicano? No, not Tipicano, the other road on Redlands Boulevard going toward the Moreno Valley, where the, actually the speed drops all the way to 25. And you really have to do 25. I mean, I tried it before, and if you come in even at 30, you feel like the car is going to go and hit the mountain. So you have to be very careful with these things. And, uh, okay, so I think they're doing a big construction there. I think they're going to make a new road in that direction because a lot of people did not really expect the 25 speed limit there. So that's two options really. As uh, civil engineers, they deal with this problem. Either they bank the road, they make it tilted a little bit like the NASCAR cars when they're going on, on in the field, or, and actually not or, uh, add more friction and do a lot of studies between the composition of the asphalt and the tires that makes up most of the cars and come up with a number. And they say, okay, this, radius is so sharp that we really need to reduce this V so much so that the person can safely make it without having to go and end up on the other side of the, uh, the curve, okay? This is your question of the day, another one, okay? I know we had one, so this is another one. Suppose you double the speed at which you round a bend in the curve. By what factor must the centripetal force change to prevent you from skidding? In other words, for example, they say the speed is, let's say, for example, the person, 
the speed limit is 20 miles per hour and you want to do 40 miles per hour. Okay? So how much friction you really need to hold you in place? That's basically the question. From previous friction. Okay? Oh no, you need more. You went too fast now. Kyle, you, need, you already doubled the speed. So if you went too fast, you need more force to hold you in place. Do you understand that? Remember V squared now over R. The curvature did not change. The turn did not change. So the R did not change. Okay. So now you're going too fast for the road, twice as much. So if somebody will need to hold you in place, they need to apply four times because you're gonna square the twice. So the correct answer is four times. Does it make sense to you, Kyle, now? Everybody else too. Yes? So if you want to double the speed, you're going on a crazy, basically, ride on that thing. So you hope that the engineers thought of you enough to have uh, as much friction as possible to hold you in place. Otherwise, for sure, you're going to slide. Okay? Don't do it. If it tells you 25 miles per hour, believe me, at least try it in here near Redlands, between Redlands and uh, going toward Moreno Valley. Not on Tipicano, not on the... Uh, on that uh, big curvy ring in there where there is those wild horses. I don't know if you guys know the area or not, but there is one in here, but this is actually a very sharp turn, okay? Somebody does? No, I'm sorry, yes, Ritchie Canyon. Not Ritchie Canyon, as a matter of fact. There is another one parallel to it on the other side that lends you very far away from uh, uh, Moreno Valley, actually on the other side toward the, uh, toward the edge of Moreno Valley. I forgot the name for it. It's called, I think, uh, Redlands Boulevard, I think. It goes also through the mountains in there and all of that. Okay. Yeah, I think that's what it is. Yeah, it's Redlands Boulevard. Off of Colton going to Redlands Boulevard. So again, the explanation has to do with this speed squared. Centrifugal source, I already talked to you about. It has to do, for example, uh, with the fact that it is actually an inertial force. If you cut this, it's going to go away. This is a typical question that you will find a lot of the time is in SAT questions and things like that. So it was moving, you cut it to which way it's going to go, it's going to continue in that path because of the first law, okay? So this is the force, which is really not due to interaction but it's really due to MA that keep you going. And that's really what keep you moving in the opposite direction if your car turns on one way. That's what actually keeps the car moving toward the edge of the other side. If you're moving, if the car is turning this way, that's what keeps you going that way. If you have a, a hanging thing on your uh, rear mirror, you will see that. We are at 5.08, so we really need to finish this quickly, okay? Oh man, and we have quite a few to talk about. So again, this is a centripetal force. This is how you make artificial uh, gravity, basically. Again, you spin the object. You make it go around in such a way that V squared over R, remember V is actually omega R. So there is another way of writing this when I'll just say omega squared times R, okay? And that's how you do artificial intelligence. And that's why you see in interstellar movies and sci-fi movies, they do that spinning thing to keep you, to give you artificial intelligence, artificial, artificial uh, gravity, okay? And there is calculations, it's actually fun to see how much rotation you really need to have a G-force, okay? What you would want to have a G-force. Which brings me to the concept of angular momentum, which is a key concept. Again, angular momentum is the moment of inertia I times the angular velocity omega. That's one way of saying it. For a point charge and a point charge only, it's, it's linear momentum times its radius, okay? For a more complicated object, it's really a little bit more complicated than that. Depends on geometry, really. So that's what I was saying in here. Linear momentum is mv uh, times the radius 
that is for a point chart. So unless torques, if there are no torques, like for example, after the solar system formed, which was really coming together due to its own gravity. So there was no torque coming together from another star or another galaxy or anything that forced the sun to come together with all of its planets. So the angular momentum must be conserved. So all the objects need to retain their mom angular momentum. The objects that are moving closer, they need to move faster than the objects that are moving for, further away. For example, the year on the Earth is 12 months. The year on Jupiter takes 12 years. It's a lot longer. If you were born on Jupiter right now, you are roughly about two years old. Okay, you are still a baby. If you are, for example, on planet Venus, the year there is about what eight months or seven months. The year from here. So for each time the Venus goes around once around the uh, the Sun, the Earth takes longer. So that explains one one thing about the uh, speeds of the of the uh, solar system. But it's actually not related to that. It's more of how the shape of the solar system look like. Okay the shape of the solar system and that of the entire galaxy is due to the conservation of the angular momentum. The symbol for the angular momentum is L, by the way, and it's equal to I times omega. That number must have been the same for the entire solar system when it was formed. Now, there are some oddities in the solar system. Some planets are a little above the, the plane, sometimes are below, sometimes they're spinning in a weird fashion. Those can be explained by after effect, basically, when the solar system formed, objects collided with one another and they would get bumped in and out of their uh, orbits a little, okay? That's the case, for example, with, the, with Venus actually spinning backward, okay? So the sun, for example, on Venus actually arises in the west and sets in the east completely backward. And the day on Venus takes a lot longer than the year on Venus, which is kind of weird, okay? You ask how many years in a day on Venus, you don't ask how many days in a year. And uh, also with the Uranus, also it's actually flipped sideways. And the other planets more or less are the same because the collisions that happen later, right? For example, the Earth is not exactly spinning uh, uh, around its, the axis, it's still a little bit tilted. Thank God it does because otherwise the seasons would not be the same way. We would have not have the seasons the way we have them and the probably life would not be possible on Earth, okay? Think whatever, okay? So you don't have to believe in God if you don't want to, okay? Suppose that you are swirling a can, so when you suddenly pull it closer, so it was spinning, so when you pull it closer, remember, uh, I omega, and now it's moving closer. This is MVR, actually. So if R now is half, it needs to move faster to contain its momentum. Remember, the mass is the same in this case, okay? So if you, uh, if you bring it halfway, by what factor would the speed need to go? It needs to double. So again, I talked about the conservation of angular momentum, and this is exactly what the ballerina does, okay? When she brings her hands up close, she moves fast. When she pulls them down, she slows down, okay? And that is because when she brings them down, she has less eye, which means her omega will uh, go up. When she pulls them up, then she has a higher I, that means her omega comes down. Okay, that's what the ballerinas do all the time, okay? And actually, there is a nice exercise that go with this one, basically where you can uh, check the conservation of, uh, of the energy and you will think that actually there is an energy being dispensed in this process. Okay, this is chapter eight. We still have more stuff to cover in this class. And for those of you who are sitting in my physics 11, we're going to meet today at what time? 6 p.m. For those who are not, I will see you guys on Tuesday of next week. Unless you guys have any questions right now. Don't forget, I think there are a few assignments that are due to, including those homework problems. Bye. Any questions? No? Okay, bye.